This is going to be Genesis chapter number 13. And remember in the last chapter, Abram lied about Sarah, his wife. He lied about her being his wife, said that she was his sister to Pharaoh. So she ends up in Pharaoh's house and um, they get kicked out of Egypt because Pharaoh was uh, unknowingly in danger of committing adultery with Sarai. And for this reason, Pharaoh tells them to hit the road. And they get out of there. But remember that I told you that Egypt is a type of the sinful world. And Abram going into Egypt is an illustration of me and you going into the world and getting away from God. And in this next chapter, you're going to see that Abram leaves Egypt. And some great things happen. So I want to teach you on the subject of seven things to expect when you leave Egypt. Now, the first one is trouble from what you take with you. You can expect that. You can expect trouble. When you leave the world, you're going to have some baggage. And in Genesis 13, 1 through 2, it says, And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot went with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold. So Abram was a wealthy man. And he got even more wealthy while in Egypt because, remember, Pharaoh took good care of him because he liked uh, Sarah so much. In Genesis twelve sixteen, it says, And he entreated Abram well for her sake. And he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. No doubt Abraham left Egypt with things that he left with things that he didn't have before he got there. And when we get out in the world away from God, no doubt about it, when we come back to God, we're going to have some things left in our possession, some marks, some evidence that we were out wandering in the world. We're going to have something. Something to expect when you leave Egypt is that trouble will follow with you into your new walk with the Lord. Because in Galatians 6, 7, it says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. God forgives you for anything, but that doesn't mean you won't still reap the thing. Something else that Abram still had with him was Lot. Lot came with him into Egypt. Lot came with him out of Egypt. He would have been better off just to have left Lot there. Abram could have let his wealth hold him back, but he didn't. And for many people, their downfall is their own prosperity. It says in Proverbs one thirty two, For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. Jesus told a rich guy one time, he said, Take up your cross and follow me. In Mark 10.22, you see that the guy didn't like that. And it says, And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Now, Abram had great possessions, but he didn't let it stop him. Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, 9, that they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Most times, prosperity just makes you worse. And you may have a lot of things from when you were out in the world. They might cause you extra temptations. They might tempt you to go back to Egypt, but don't let them hold you back. Something else Abram probably brought with him out of Egypt was a woman named Hagar. In Genesis 16, 1, it says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children. And she had an handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. Abram, God, you see what's going to happen later is Abram gets in a hurry on God about the promised seed. You see, Sarah and Abram weren't having any luck having a child, so Sarah and Abram take Hagar, and he has a child by her. And this caused a child to be born named Ishmael. He was a wild man, the Bible says, and he persecutes Isaac, who is actually the seed of promise. And one little mistake, you see, can have big consequences. Some things that you take with you out of the world can bring you sorrow. So leaving the world, you can expect for trouble to come with you in some way. Number two, this is a good one. This is a good thing. If you leave the world, you can expect fellowship with the Lord. When we get off into the world, we don't lose salvation, but we lose fellowship. And if you listen to my lesson on Genesis 12, you saw how that Abraham was building altars and calling on the name of the Lord until 
he got to Egypt, and he lost some fellowship there. But now that he's left Egypt, look what happens. In Genesis 13.3, it says, And he went on his journeys from the south, so now he's going back north, even to Bethel and to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai. So, so he went to where his tent had been at the beginning. If you have lost fellowship, then you need to go back to where you were at the beginning. If I lose fellowship, I go back to that book, doing verse by verse. That is what made me fall in love with the Christian life in the first place, was verse by verse Bible studies. I remember it just like it was yesterday, the first, very first one I did in the book of Revelation. I just got that Ruckman reference Bible, and I started listening to verse by verse by a man named Robert Hensley. There's no relation there. Me and him aren't related. I, I've never met him. And it just made me fall in love with the Bible. And I've been doing that ever since, doing verse-by-verse -verse studies. Anytime that I felt like I was getting a little cold, I just went back to doing that, which I never have really stopped for long periods of time at all. <clears throat> back when I first got saved, I was having... Or when I first got married, I was having to work a lot. That kind of stopped me for a bit because I wasn't getting any breaks and things like that. But it was just for a very short time. And right when I felt myself getting cold, I just... I I'd, I'd got an, another job where I had more time and I was back into the, doing the verse-by-verse -verse studies. Just constantly taking notes in my Bible on on things. And that's what made me fall in love with the Christian life in the first place. So you need to go back to the beginning. In Revelation 2, 4, it says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. You know, when you leave your first love, go back. Revelation 2, 5, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Remember what it was that really made you fall in love with God in the Bible. Then go back to doing that. Repent, and do the first works. Abram went back to where he was at the beginning. Now you see the result in verse 4, Genesis 13, 4. It says, Unto the place of the altar. He went back to where he was at the beginning, unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. So he went back to where he was at the first, and he got back in fellowship. Abraham... Abram left Egypt and got back in fellowship with the Lord. And it's not hard to get back in fellowship. You just, you come to God right now, tell Him you want to be back in fellowship. It says in 1 John 1, 6 through 9, If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus Christ's blood not only cleansed me of my sins eternally, but also cleanses of me of my sin practically in my everyday walk. And when you leave the world and get back, you get back with the Lord, get back in fellowship. Number three, Something else to expect when you leave the world and get back in there with other Christians, you can expect strife. Not everything's just going to be great all the time. When people get together, don't matter if they're Christians or not Christians, they're going to disagree, they're going to butt heads. You have to realize that. Many people think that they're just going to go to church and get together with other Christians and never see a liar or a backstabber or a troublemaker or a backbiter or anything. You have to realize that you're going to see strife. In Genesis 13, 5 through 7, And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together, for their substance was great so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. So they had so much stuff they couldn't even dwell together. And it's a, it's a shame they had strife going on between their herdmen. And it's a shame when the lost world sees the saints at strife with each other. You see, it, notice it just tucked that in there at the end. It said, And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abram didn't want the Canaanite and the Perizzite to see that strife, most likely. So he's like, we got to separate. 
You know, you don't want the lost world to see you fighting back and forth with another Christian all the time. So, in Genesis 13, 8, it says, And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. A man who is in fellowship with the Lord doesn't want continuous strife over something that can be prevented. In Philippians 1.15 it said, Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. Some people out there, all they want is strife. In James 3.16 it says, For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. Sometimes all men want to do is stay in continual strife with other Christians. I mean, they believe they're taking some big, bold stand for the faith, but in reality, they're simply spreading strife. Not only does it give the lost world occasion to blaspheme, but it also causes the saints that hear them to be a bunch of sourpuss smart alecks. It just it makes the saints that hear them just be smart alecks, down on everybody. It makes them look like they just hate everybody. When they go to church, they don't go to get a blessing. They go to point out all the preacher's flaws and to make a big deal out of everything he says that they don't agree with. They don't want to give anybody around them an opportunity to be themselves and be who they are. And I've figured out over the years that you're not going to get nowhere by trying to be like everybody else. You have to be who you are. But uh, that's, that's what they do. They just go around. It makes them go around and be a bunch of sourpuss smart alecks who are just at strife with everybody all the time. When I hear a preacher who obviously loves God and preaching the Bible, I love the sermon, I love the preacher, I don't care what his style is, you just got to learn to just chill out, relax, stay calm. Not everybody is just like you. I don't have to correct the pastor. I don't have to cause him strife. Just let him be him and say what he believes God wants him to say. There's no need in going and causing trouble and strife everywhere that you go. And this is the best, I can, best advice I could give a lot of Christians. The advice is that you're going to have to get over yourself. You're so full of self and pride that you think you're above all the other Christians. And you think you can sit in judgment of all the other Christians. And you say, well, I'm judging righteous judgment according to the Bible. But in reality, you're just backbiting, troublemaking, with a serpent tongue. You need to go back to the milk of the word before you try to get into the meat of the word because you obviously don't even know how to love your own brother in the Lord. Jesus didn't say, I know you're truly my disciple because you can correct everyone's doctrine and point out all their flaws and spend hours over arguing over semantics. No, he actually said in John thirteen thirty five, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. And if you really love another Christian, those tiny little disagreements, it's going to seem very small. In Romans twelve eighteen, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. You can live peaceably with them. It says in Galatians 6.10, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith, other Christians. So I don't care if a man has disagreements with me on stuff. When I hear him quote the Bible, when I hear him praise the Lord Jesus Christ, exalt the Savior, and say things like the blood of Jesus Christ, something in me has a love for that person, whether they're black, brown, white, pale, short, fat, ugly, tall, He's got something in him that I have in me. And in my mind, he's got the same colored jersey on that I have. We're on the same team. In Mark nine thirty eight through 40, it says, And John answered him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not us. And we forbade him, because he followeth not us. But Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name. That can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. If someone has believed on Jesus Christ and they love Jesus Christ, then I, I really have no right to not love that person, be a brother to that person. Quit with the strife. You just look like a drama queen. You're not some big giant in the faith. In your mind, you think you're a big hero of the faith. But in everybody else's mind, you have drama, drama queen 
written across your forehead in purple lipstick. I mean, it's sticking out like a sore thumb. Everybody sees it but you. There's definitely a time when heresy needs to be exposed. There is a time when you have to separate. But when your whole entire world revolves around straightening everyone out around you, you're just as much as in the wrong as they are. You're just at strife with somebody constantly, and it makes the people who look up to you and listen to you, they are in strife with everybody all the time. And I see it every day because I know who follows who on here. And if they're following somebody that's always in strife, they're coming to my videos and they're trying to start stuff with me every single day. Or if I'm watching another preacher and I know that this person who's watching it and uh, disagreeing with it likes or listens to a certain preacher that's always at strife, they're, they're always at strife with everybody else. They do not know how to get along. That's a big thing is I've noticed... A lot of the people, uh, younger men today, not so much the older ones, but the younger ones, they're just training a bunch of people to just hate everybody and not get along with anybody. And that is a very bad thing. If you, if you can't even teach them to get along with others, you ain't even got, a, got them learned in the milk of the word yet. In Philippians two fourteen, do all things without murmurings and and disputing without murmurings and disputings. I'm just not seeing in the Bible uh, anything backing up what most people are doing on here. Constantly at each other's throat. But when you come out of Egypt, you can just go ahead and expect it for there to be strife. When you come out of Egypt, the fourth thing you can expect separating from old friends. In Genesis thirteen nine, it says, Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. So notice that Abraham isn't picky. People today are so picky. Uh, they have to have it how they want it. And if they don't get it how they want it, then they cry about it. And a man that is right with God is content. He's going to be okay with whatever he has to go through. In Hebrews 13, 5, it says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. In Philippians 4, 11, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. When I'm at work, I try to never complain, especially not around the bosses. I, don't com I try not to never complain. There's just no need in it. I mean, it's not going to make things any better to just go around and complain all the time. And Abram was also willing to, to let Lot choose where he wanted to go. Abraham just knew he had to separate from him. But a great characteristic Abram had was being able to put others before himself. And in Philippians 2, 4, it says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now, most people is failing in that. In 1 Corinthians 10, 24, it says, Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. How are you doing on that? So you're going to have to think about other people first. The Bible says Jesus pleased not his own self. Uh, he left heaven. He left the riches of heaven to come down here to you. But Abram had to separate. He had to separate from old friends. He had to separate from Lot. He had to separate from Pharaoh. I mean, I'm sure him and Pharaoh became pretty good friends there back before he knew that Sarah was actually his wife. And it says in 2 Corinthians six seventeen, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. When you leave Egypt, you're going to have to discover that there are all kinds of things out there that you're going to have to separate from, things and people you're going to have to separate from it when you come out of Egypt. And you're going to also see, this will be number five, you're going to see some things in your Christian walk that are worldly counterfeits that make you want to go back to the world. So number five, worldly counterfeits. You can expect this. You're going to see this in Christian circles, in Christian bookstores, if there's any left, hardly. Anywhere that there's supposedly Christian stuff going on, you're going to see worldly counterfeits the greatest example 
is worldly so-called Christian music. And for a while, I thought that this was the devil trying to counterfeit godly music. But lately, I'm kind of convinced that it's Christians trying to counterfeit the devil's music. It's like an off-brand. The contemporary music is like an off-brand of what the devil puts out. It kind of looks like it. It sounds like it. They dress like it. But it's missing something. It just doesn't taste the same. You know what I mean? And if I'm going to have to listen to music that's ungodly, which this is my belief, I believe that contemporary Christian music is not godly music. And if I'm going to have to listen to ungodly rock music, I might as well just listen to the real thing. The contemporary Christian stuff is not even catchy. Now, I personally don't think you should listen to any of it, whether it be secular or contemporary. But the counterfeit off-brand just makes you want Egypt's music back. The drums, the beat, and the feeling that you get from Christian rap and Christian rock just remind you of Egypt. It reminds me of Egypt. It reminds me of all the music I listened to back when I was in Egypt. This was Lot's problem. He knew he couldn't have Egypt, so he took the next best thing. And a lot of Christians, they, they realize, well, God doesn't want me to listen to ACDC and Metallica anymore. So... They take the next best thing. They take the worldly counterfeit, which I believe is Christians trying to counterfeit the devil's music because the devil knows how to make catchy music. The devil knows how to make music that our flesh is going to like a lot. It says in Genesis 13, 10, And Lot lifted up his eyes, and behold, all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, before, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Lot saw Sodom. One of the main categories of sin is the lust of the eyes. Lot saw that it was like the land of Egypt. So, he, he, he knows that he can't go back to Egypt. He wants the next best thing. And that's the problem with this modern stuff. It is in Egypt, but it's like it. And i just seen a church... In my town or close to my town, and their Bible school was called Totally 80s. And it was an 80s-themed Bible school. And the directors or counselors or teachers of that thing was wearing ACDC t-shirts and Pink Floyd t-shirts with fake long hair and bandanas on. And they got in there and said, you know, with their ACDC shirts on, said, come learn about Jesus Christ. And I'm thinking, which Christ are you talking about? Which Christ are you teaching the kids about? With an ACDC shirt on? I mean, I'm a pretty open-minded person, but I'm not that open-minded. They were trying to pull you out of the world. They're trying to pull people out of the world by attracting them with the world. How does that make sense? It made absolute zero sense. So let me get this straight. You're against sex and drugs, and you're going to tell the kid that it's wrong to have sex and it's wrong to do drugs, which it obviously, obviously is, but you're teaching the kids rock and roll. Well, sex and drugs is rock and roll. That's what ACDC is about. That's what Pink Floyd was about. That's what classic rock was about. That's what the music today is about. So you can't use the thing that is keeping people in the world to draw people out of the world. I mean, where is their sense? I mean, I just, I'm lost about how they think that stuff's going to work. And they may come, they may, people may go to that church, a lot of people, but it's only because they're satisfying that worldly craving while they can ease their conscience as well at the same time. And Genesis thirteen eleven through 12, Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent towards Sodom. Lot had several steps that put him back in a worldly situation. I mean, he saw it. He saw the place. Number two, he chose it in verse 11. In verse 12, he pinched, he pitched his tent toward it. Then he finally dwells there in chapter 14. And then in chapter 19, it says he sit, sat in the gate. So not only was he, he looked at it, he saw it look good, then he, he, he faced towards it, 
and then he finally dwelt there, and then he sat in the gate. This means he ended up having some like leadership there, like in the in the government aspect of it. So he had to have compromised to get that type of position in a place like Sodom, because we know from the New Testament, it says we know that he was a saint. So he had to compromise some of his beliefs to rise to power in a place like that. Sin is a progression. And if you stay in it, then you get worse. Lot got worse and worse and worse. Growing in the Lord is a progression. And if you stay in the book, you get better and better. And the sixth thing. When you leave Egypt, you can expect for sin to look worse. Once you get out of the world and into the Bible and the prayer closet, sin will start looking a lot worse. And I remember when I first got saved and I threw out my movies and my CDs and, I, and my video games and everything. I was at somebody's house. This was like three months later. I was at somebody's house and they were watching the ball drop for New Year's. And I seen Kesha or somebody like that performing on the TV and it just made me sick to my stomach and I thought in my mind has the world went this far down the drain since I got saved like three months ago but it wasn't that it it really hadn't gotten that much worse in that short length of time it was that I hadn't hardly seen any any worldly entertainment for the past three months and I'd been so engobbed in the book that it was becoming all I knew and the Holy Spirit had been conforming me to the image of his son and the Holy Spirit had been rewiring my brain, my mind. As Paul says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So that's what was going on. But when you get out of Egypt, sin's going to look a lot worse to you when you come across it again. And that's why in Genesis 13 to 13, it says, But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Not all sin is the same. Some sins are worse than others, and that's why it says here, exceedingly. When you get out of, this, out of the world, you're going to see sin for what it really is. And this verse said that the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. That would be to a very great degree, exceedingly would be. Now, if you're living in Egypt and your whole Christian life is in, in Egypt, and someone asks you about the Sodomite lifestyle, you're probably going to say something like, well, it's... It's just not God's best. I mean, that's what Joel Osteen said about it. But if you're in the Bible, then you see that the things going on in America today are exceeding sinful. And they have cranked up the sin o to 666. And Romans 7, 13 says, Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Notice that the word sinners is first mentioned in Genesis 13, 13. 13 is the number of rebellion in your Bible. It's a very negative number connected with the Antichrist and a lot of wicked things. Notice it said they were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Put wicked and sinners together, that's 13 letters. There's 13 words in Genesis 13, 13. Homosexuality has 13 letters. Romans 7, 13 has that same word, exceeding. Sodom, Gomorrah, side by side, 13 letters. Judas Iscariot, 13 letters. Throughout the scriptures, 13 is connected with rebellion. Nimrod means rebel. He was wicked and he was the 13th from Adam. The first time the word 13th shows up in the Bible, it says in Genesis 14, 4, 12 years they served Cheddar Laomer, and in the 13th year they rebelled. So, did you know that 13-year-olds are notoriously known for being rebellious? When you get out of the world, you're going to see sin for what it is. It's going to look exceeding sinful to you. Now, number seven, the last thing. When you get out of this world, you're gonna, when you get out of Egypt, you're going to become heavenly minded. In Genesis 13, 14, it says, And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art northward, and southward, and eastward, and westward. Now that Abram is separated from Lot, you'll notice that God begins to talk about his covenant with him again. And I guess when you're leaving Egypt, when you, or when you're living in Egypt, 
your covenant with the Lord is on the back of your mind instead of being on the forefront of your mind. In Genesis thirteen fifteen, it says, For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. The Bible says, Set your affection on things above. If you're living for the Lord, and you're heavenly minded now, God's promising you an inheritance. Just like Abraham was going to inherit something. It says, For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. This is God's unconditional promise to Abraham. People today believe that God is done with the nation of Israel, but they believe that the church replaced Israel. The fact that the Jews are wicked and enemies to the gospel today doesn't mean that there won't be a believing remnant of Jews later, you see. Abraham and Israel will, will begin to possess their land in the millennium. Hebrews 11, 9 and 10 says, By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He was looking for a heavenly city. Abraham got heavenly minded. In Genesis thirteen sixteen, it says, And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Not only... As Abraham already had innumerable uh, children, but I believe this also refers to something bigger in the future. Abraham's seed is going to be so many that you can't number them. And this will mostly begin in the millennium and go on out into eternity. You're going to have children being born and never dying. And they will continue to have children because there will be people who are in natural bodies that eat off the tree of life and live forever. And they... They'll, they'll continue to have children. Unlike me and you, we'll be in glorified bodies that neither marry nor are given in marriage. Me and you are in the body of Christ, a completely different group of saints than the people that I just referred to. But there's no doubt about it. Abraham's seed, it's never going to stop growing. It's going to be so many that you can't even number it. In Isaiah 9, 7, it says, Of the increase of his government, talking about the Lord Jesus, and peace there shall be no end. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. It's going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But in closing here, you need to go out into the world, but don't be of the world. That's what Abraham did. Genesis thirteen seventeen, The Lord tells him, Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. We have to walk through this world. We have to be a shining light. And as bad as we may want to, we shouldn't get off in a cave somewhere. We need to go out into this world and preach the gospel to every creature. Abraham, walking through the land, pictures that. While we walk through this land, we're going to see things that tempt us, try us, test us, anger us, vex us. But we have to remember to go out into the world and not be of the world. We don't want to be like Demas who loved this present world. And 1 John 2.15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So, that's seven things that you can expect when you leave Egypt.